you're good to go for it whenever, Hash. Awesome, thanks, Darren. Already. All right, hi everyone. My name is Hashem. I'm a third year resident here in Ottawa, and um, the title of my presentation is Breaking the Brain Code, a phased approach to elevated intracranial pressure in the ED. Let's begin with a scenario. It's midnight. A patch comes in for a 35-year-old male with decreased level of consciousness. He is healthy and has never visited the hospital. He lives at home with his parents after some financial difficulties. The patient has had a progressive headache and fever for two days. He drove himself to get a COVID swab in the afternoon. A couple hours after he got home, he began slurring his words. He didn't seem to understand what his parents were saying to him. Within 30 minutes, his parents said he was falling over himself, crashing into furniture. They tried to get him to lie down. They didn't know him to have any significant substance use, but they were concerned. Within one hour, he had begun vomiting. Slowly, he grew more somnolent and less responsive. The parents called 911. Upon EMS arrival, he was a GCS of nine, tachycardic and hypertensive, but protecting his airway and breathing comfortably. His glucose was normal. His vitals remained stable throughout transport. Upon arrival to your resuscitation bay, he's not speaking or moving besides some mildly labored breaths. His ABCs are unremarkable. As the nurses are finishing placing monitors, you notice his arms and legs are stiff and extended. His pupils are four millimeters and minimally reactive. He's not responding to voice or pain. He has several bruises along the left side of his thorax. There's a two centimeter laceration to his forehead with no boggy hematoma or other signs of head trauma. You see that his blood pressure is 220 over 130. After the nurses establish an IV, you notice his breathing become more labored and he requires bagging. You decide to intubate the patient to facilitate a CT scan of the head. While he's in the scanner, his image has come up. Acute multifocal intracranial hemorrhages. You do not appreciate a significant midline shift. There appears to be some effacement of the basal cisterns. You page near surgery immediately. As you wait for your patient to return from CT scan, you begin to think about your next steps. How do I treat this massive intracranial bleed who may have a critically elevated intracranial pressure? But then you think about your previous steps. Did you do everything you needed to initially? He's been here for over 30 minutes. Should you have started other treatments? Should you start them now? This was a case I saw several months ago, but I'm sure certain aspects of it will resonate with many of you. It exemplifies the diagnostic and therapeutic dilemmas that arise in patients with altered mental status and concern for critically elevated intracranial pressure. It exemplifies the gravity of the situation. Elevated ICP has consistently been shown to be associated with poor neurological outcomes. Our ability to expeditiously recognize and treat elevated ICP can influence patient outcomes. A large retrospective study of nearly 1,500 TBI patients demonstrated improved outcomes in patients with fewer hours of elevated ICP in the first day after injury. A prospective cohort study of head injured patients identified increased ICP as one of only two treatable independent risk factors for mortality, along with systemic hypertension. As with other critical illnesses, our management of elevated ICP in the ED matters. Throughout much of the case I presented, I felt uncertain about my diagnosis and treatment options. If you've similarly felt in the dark about a case like this, whether you were unconfident in your diagnosis of elevated ICP or how to prioritize the many treatment options, my hope is to elucidate a simplified evidence-based approach to diagnosis and management of patients with elevated ICP in the emergency department. The objectives of my talk are as follows. One, discuss diagnosis of elevated ICP in the ED. Two, distill, distill guidelines of different etiologies of elevated ICP into practical steps for ED management. And three, explore the latest evidence behind specific therapies for elevated ICP, including neuroprotective intubation, hyperventilation, hyperosmolar fluids, and corticosteroids. Before embarking, it's worth clarifying some terminology and briefly reviewing the fundamentals of cerebral physiology. We know that neurons are sensitive to decreased perfusion, and so the cerebral vasculature must maintain tight hemodynamic control of cerebral blood flow. We can conceptualize cerebral blood flow as the difference in blood pressure between the carotid artery and jugular vein, 
divided by the cerebrovascular resistance. Cerebral vessels maintain perfusion by adjusting cerebral vascular resistance. This is important to make sure that changes in systolic blood pressure, respiratory status, and physical posture don't wreak havoc on cerebral blood flow. This is called autoregulation. And while it's not completely understood, there are two important mechanisms. One, decreased arterial pressure induces vasodilation, and two, hypercapnia induces vasodilation. Another important concept is that of cerebral perfusion pressure, which is equal to the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. Intracranial pressure is defined as the, as the pressure exerted by fluids inside the cranium. The principal components that dictate this pressure are blood, both arterial and venous, CSF, and brain parenchyma. The normal ICP for an adult is 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Now, in normal healthy brain, this is how cerebral blood flow and cerebral perfusion pressures are related. You'll notice that for the most part, they're directly correlated so that increases in cerebral perfusion pressure cause increases in cerebral blood flow. However, for perfusion pressures between 50 and about 150, the cerebral blood flow does not change. This is the normalizing effect of autoregulation. And like we said, it is an important mechanism for dealing with factors affecting cerebral perfusion pressure. What happens in the neurologically injured brain? Well, we introduce a fifth component, such as cerebral edema or a hematoma. According to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, the cranium is a fixed inelastic container, so we must have a compensatory decrease in one or more of the other normal components. Venous blood is usually the first component to be shunted out of the cranium, followed by CSF. By doing this, the overall intracranial volume, and thus intracranial pressure, remains normal. However, with a large enough mass, or with a reduced capacity to drain CSF or venous blood, this equilibrium was lost, and instead the intracranial pressure begins to rise. With sustained elevated ICP, compensatory mechanisms are so overwhelmed that brain parenchyma itself may be forced through anatomic openings in the, in the cranium. This is brain herniation, and it can result in compression of critical structures such as the brainstem, cerebral arteries, and nerves. The other concern with sustained elevated ICP is the decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. If we look back at our graph, the state of increased ICP and therefore decreased CPP can result in hypoperfusion and ischemia of the brain. Now the body may try to compensate for this by increasing MAP, usually by bolstering cardiac output, and can bring cerebral perfusion pressure back into the range in which cerebral vessels can autoregulate and maintain cerebral blood flow. The issue is that, that neurological injury can independently disrupt auto, this autoregulation. Without autoregulation, cerebral blood flow becomes more directly correlated to cerebral perfusion pressure, and acute, acute rises in ICP can quickly result in cerebral hypoperfusion and ischemia. These deleterious effects of sustained elevated ICP are sometimes referred to as brain codes. They represent critical conditions that require acute resuscitation with adherence to physiologic principles. As clinicians, we must recognize that the only way to prevent hypoperfusion is to relieve the elevation in ICP while maintaining adequate MAP. This is analogous to conditions such as tension pneumothorax or cardiac tamponade, in which there's an entity obstructing normal cardiopulmonary circulation, resulting in systemic hypoperfusion. Brain codes can thus be thought of as an obstructive shock of the CNS. There are many etiologies for elevated elevations in ICP, and while I've categorized them by type of mass, it's understood that cerebral edema plays a role in nearly all of these etiologies. With that in mind, I just want to provide a disclaimer around much of the evidence we'll be discussing going forward. It's important to acknowledge that the majority of elevated ICP research involves patients with TBI. The applicability to patients with other etiologies is debatable, but I'll try to distinguish and clarify what conditions are being addressed as we go along. Secondly, almost all of these studies involve ICU populations. Finding ED-specific studies is very difficult, and in most cases, we're forced to extrapolate conclusions from the def more definitive findings in the ICU setting. Also, the majority of the evidence is graded as low or very low. The studies are usually small, involving less than 200 patients in even the largest trials. Finally, it is important to keep outcomes clear. 
Many studies assess changes in ICP only, whereas others assess the more important patient-centered outcomes such as mortality and neurologic recovery. Let's move on to diagnosis of increased ICP. The gold standard for diagnosis is the invasive intracranial monitor, of which there are a variety. The most widely used is the extraventricular drain, or EPD. Insertion of an ICP monitor is obviously a, a highly invasive procedure with significant risks, and in most cases only neurosurgeons per, uh, perform this procedure. There's also mounting evidence that invasive ICP monitoring may not improve patient outcomes. Uh, the BOOST 3 RCT is currently in its second phase and hopefully uh, will answer this question. That being said, ICP monitors are the standard of care in neurocritical care centers, and many intensivists support their use. Now in the ED, we rarely, if ever, have the luxury of an invasive ICP monitor. Therefore, we must maintain a high index of suspicion based on history and non-invasive exam findings. In patients that can't provide history, classic symptoms of elevated ICP include headache, vomiting, and visual changes. However, there's very little evidence to show predictive values or likelihood ratios for elevated I ICP itself. To make matters more difficult, most of these patients will have altered mental status and will be unable to provide a history. Attaining collateral history is important, but the, in the ED, we may be forced to recognize elevated ICP using examination and investigations. But how accurate are exam and imaging findings in detecting elevated ICP? Dr. Shannon Fernando and Jeff Perry answered this very question in their, in their 2019 meta-analysis. It has important implications for ED practice, and so I think it's worth taking a deeper dive into, with some added insight from Dr. Fernando along the way. The systematic review includes studies of adult ED or ICU patients with suspect, suspected elevated ICP. They included 40 studies involving over 5,000 patients comprised of the following etiologies, mostly TBI. They investigated the accuracy of non-invasive methods, including physical exam, CT scan, and ultrasound in diagnosing ICP compared to the gold standard of invasive ICP monitor. The physical exam findings they assessed uh, included decreased level of consciousness, uh, defined as a GCS of less than or equal to eight, any pupillary dilation, and motor posturing, defined as a GCS motor score of less than or equal to three. Pupillary dilation was the most specific finding at 85.9, and LOC was the most sensitive at 75.8%. CT scan findings include absence or compression of the basal cisterns, varying degrees of midline shift, and the Marshall score, which stratifies TBI according to degree of swelling and size of contusion or hemorrhage. Now, basal cistern absence or compression was the most sensitive finding at 85.9%, Midline shift of greater than 10 millimeters or one centimeter was the most specific at 89.2%. The findings are summarized nicely in this table, but notice that no single finding is particularly sensitive nor specific. Although basal cistern absence or compression is moderately, uh, uh, although basal cistern absence or compression and midline shift of greater than 10 millimeters were quite sensitive and specific respectively. Interestingly, the authors did a Bayesian analysis in using a pretest probability of 50% for both of these, finding that the presence of either finding would not sufficiently alter the post-test probability by a clinically useful margin. Dr. Fernando wants to reiterate that we should not abandon the physical exam to get altogether, but rather to consider multiple signs and not rely on a single one. Some CT imaging signs, in particular severe midline shift, are specific, so in combination with suspicion based on exam, are a reasonable indication to treat empirically for elevated ICP. Recently, there has been increased interest in using point-of-care ultrasound to diagnose elevated ICP. Uh, one technique uses a transcranial Doppler, which me measures blood flow velocities in cerebral vessels through thin bone windows in the cranium, most commonly the temporal region. The two techniques are pulsatility angle, pulsatility index, uh, which is believed to correlate to cerebrovascular resistance and arterial blood pressure. While the latter sh may show promise with a good area under the curve of 0.85, at this point, neither technique can be supported for diagnosis of elevated ICP. The more commonly studied POCUS method is the optic nerve sheath diameter, and it's measured at a point um, three millimeters behind the globe. 
The issue was that among all 10 studies included in the meta-analysis, a variety of cutoffs were used to define an increased optic nerve sheath diameter in the range of 4.8 to 6.4 millimeters. The pooled area under the receiver operating characteristic curve was an impressive 0.94. Now, another systematic review from 2019 also examined the role of optic nerve sheath diameter in the diagnosis of increased ICP. It included studies involving patients from any setting with suspicion for elevated ICP, involving a slight majority of patients with TBI. However, they utilized several comparators as the reference standard, including CT scan and opening pressures from LP, from LP in addition to the gold standard of invasive ICP monitor. As we saw in Shannon's study, CT has limited accuracy in diagnosing ICP itself. The authors of this meta-analysis found some pretty impressive numbers, including a sensitivity of 97% and specificity of 86% in TBI. Now, they also analyzed a variety of cutoffs to find an optimal optic nerve sheath diameter threshold of 5 millimeters. The main issue with this study comes back to that reference standard and not restricting to the gold standard of invasive ICP monitor. I will therefore recommend interpreting these results with caution and would certainly not advocate using a five millimeter cutoff to diagnose elevated ICP. Taking these meta-analyses together, I would echo Shannon's study in saying that optic nerve sheath diameter is not ready for prime time and would caution against using specific cutoffs. If there's a particularly wide diameter such as seven millimeters and it's in keeping with other non-invasive signs, it would be reasonable to treat empirically for elevated ICP. In summary, the recognition of elevated ICP in the ED requires clinical suspicion based on multiple exam and imaging findings, as no single finding is sensitive or specific enough to rule the diagnosis in or out. Focus findings have limited diagnostic utility. If you're going to use optic nerve sheath diameter, use a very high threshold such as 6.5 millimeters, and only as a confirmation of elevated ICP based on other non-invasive findings. Remember to document a thorough neuro neurological exam before proceeding to advanced management. If we revisit our case, recall that our patient had a headache and vomiting prior to presentation. On exam, he had non-dilated pupils, but decreased GCS, motor posturing, and his CT scan showed effacement of the basal cisterns without significant midline shift. You evaluate this patient to have a high probability of elevated ICP. Now that we have a better idea of how to recognize elevated ICP in our patients, let's figure out how to manage it. Now, there are several guidelines for treatment of particular etiologies of, of elevated ICP. Chief amongst them are the Brain Trauma Foundation Guidelines for Severe Trauma for a Severe Traumatic Brain Injury that were published in 2016. This includes 28 evidence and expert-based recommendations. Unfortunately, they provide little clinical utility in terms of a practical algorithm or hierarchy. In response, the 2019 Seattle TBI Consensus Conference published a three-tiered algorithm that organizes the BTF recommendations into a hierarchy based on quality of evidence and associated risks. The AHA also has treatment guidelines for other particular etiologies. However, there remains less guidance for emergency physicians who must make swift, critical treatment decisions without the luxury of diagnostic clarity in the form of advanced imaging results or invasive monitoring. Worse yet, Many of these guidelines are at odds with each other for patients with an unknown etiology of elevated ICP. Fortunately, there has been some recent guidance from the Neurocritical Care Society, or NCS. They introduced Emergency Neurological Life Support, or ENLS, in order to standardize clinical approaches to critical neurological illnesses, similarly to ACLS and ATLS. In addition, the NCS also published their guidelines for the acute treatment of cerebral edema in neurocritical care patients. These outline the evidence behind treatments in particular etiologies and bolster the more generalized treatment principles in the ENLS algorithm. Let's take a look at the latest version of this algorithm from March 2020. Similarly to the Seattle TBI consensus algorithm, it is laid, as, laid out as a tiered approach. However, it has several limitations. First, it's ICU-centric and, and has an impractical progression and utility for patients in the ED or other settings. For example, surgical decompression is placed on the same tier as hyperosmolar therapy. Second, it lacks specific instructions. For example, it doesn't provide details of fluid choice and dosing in hyperosmolar therapy. And most importantly, it's not validated. 
most it's the most pressing pressing issue because we don't know if following this algorithm actually improves patient outcomes. The ENLS algorithm also makes no mention of the plethora of other guidelines available. And in order to make sense of all of this information, I read through these guidelines in order to really distill them down, really tap into the spirit of each guideline in order to identify an empirical approach that respects each of the guidelines while remaining practical and applicable to the emergency physician. Ultimately, this is what I derived. It stratifies the components of the different guidelines by the phases of care. What's up? Does somebody have a question or? All right, I'm going to keep going. Um, so this approach is rooted in the recognition of elevated ICP as a critical condition with a variety of etiologies similarly to undifferentiated shock or cardiopulmonary arrest and focuses on fundamental management principles highlighted in green instead of precipitous focus on a particular etiology, which we may not yet know. You will notice that the CT scan is an important checkpoint in the approach, as it provides diagnostic information to help target therapy to a particular etiology, which is highlighted in blue. But regardless of the etiology, fundamental management still applies, and thus you can see that the green arrow lies at the center of the treatment pathway. Furthermore, as we discussed in the diagnosis section, CT scan itself has limited diagnostic accuracy, so the onus of recognizing elevated ICP remains on the clinician using new information as the case unfolds. The final step in the ED approach is what I've termed definitive management, and this pertains to the ultimate disposition of the patient, whether that be the operating room, ICU, or end-of-life care. Obviously, this final decision point must be tailored to the patient's particular situation and requires opinion from consulting services, as well as the patient's family. Much of this is beyond the scope of this presentation, along with the nuances of treating each particular etiology. So the remainder of this presentation will focus on management of elevated ICP in the ED, exploring the evidence behind guideline recommendations. To help bolster our discussion, I've also received some excellent input from local and formerly local experts including my Grand Round Supervisor, Dr. Ariel Hendon, Neurocritical Care Intensivist, Dr. Shane English, Neurosurgeon, Dr. Howard Lesiak, you all know Dr. Mike Hickey, as well as our airway expert, Dr. Adam Parks, and finally, Dr. Brian Glazerson, who recently completed a Neuroanesthesia and Neurocritical Care Fellowship in Boston. It's helpful to divide fundamental management in two tiers of treatment initial and refractory. The initial approach involves basic resuscitation steps with relatively strong backing evidence and consensus and should thus be instituted for all patients with suspected elevated ICP. It is ultimately geared towards good hemodynamic stability and we'll discuss how to optimize this patient with, with patient positioning, analgesia, and a considerate approach to intubation. Keep in mind that ICP management is 99% homeostasis. The goal of hemodynamic stability is to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure, which requires adequate blood pressure and oxygenation, thereby preventing secondary brain injury. In terms of blood pressure, remember that cerebral blood flow becomes more directly correlated to cerebral perfusion pressure in severe neurologic injury. Therefore, we need to defend the map and attack the ICP. But before you go all nuclear on the map, remember that pushing the map too high may actually result in hyperperfusion of the brain, which can worsen cerebral edema and contribute to hematoma expansion. For this reason, the AHA guidelines recommend lowering the systolic blood pressure to 140 for ICH and below 160 for SAH. Now, I'm not here to reanalyze the attach and interact trials. I'll refer you to the summary of Dr. Connolly's grand rounds on the Ottawa EM block, but we should treat systolic, high systolic blood pressures and attempt to maintain between 140 and 180 with short-acting beta blockers such as labetalol. Now, importantly, this shouldn't be the first step in treatment, as the blood pressure may reduce with analgesia and sedation, but it's something to keep in mind as part of your ongoing fundamental management. The other critical component of the ABCs is oxygenation. And beyond using non-invasive oxygen, this will likely involve intubation, which, will, which we will discuss shortly. 
Patient positioning should be optimized to allow unobstructed venous drainage from the cranium. Remember, this is an important compensatory mechanism to reduce SCP. Raising the head of the bed to 30 degrees is actually based on some evidence, with two observational studies showing reduction in ICP and stable CPP up to 30 degrees, and further reduction of ICP at the expense of CPP at angles above 30 degrees. In keeping with the many guidelines, I would recommend raising the head of the bed to 30 degrees and not higher. The neck should also be kept midline, and any obstructing clothing or equipment should be loosened to further allow venous drainage. Again, limited evidence, but makes physiologic sense and has very little risk. Now, this is an important point. Patients with elevated ICP are in pain. Even if they're obtunded and unable to relay that pain in a meaningful way, we need to acknowledge that this is an extremely uncomfortable condition and manage it accordingly, as pain can cause spikes in ICP and contribute to worsening cerebral perfusion pressure. For analgesia, a quick onset opioid like fentanyl is a good choice and likely what most people would reach for in the initial resuscitation. Analgesic dosing of ketamine is another reasonable option. As with other critical, critically ill patients, NSAIDs should be avoided due to risk of worsening bleeding or underlying medical conditions such as acute kidney injury. Vomiting should also be treated as this can increase ICP, so providing antiemetics is a good idea. An often overlooked point is to minimize further nauseous stimulation. Moving and turning patients, suctioning, even starting IVs are painful for the patient, and while they are necessary, we should be mindful whenever we are in physical contact with the patient and attempt to minimize these procedures whenever possible. We've now discussed, discussed some of the initial steps for managing elevated ICP. I've provided dosing for the medications we talked about. Let's revisit our case. Given your suspicion and some concerning signs of elevated ICP, you begin initial management by going through your ABCs, titrating sets to 92% with a non-rebreather. You position the patient with the head of the bed to 30 degrees, keeping his head, his neck midline, and call for a 150 microgram fentanyl bolus for analgesia. You notice one of the nurses jostling the patient to remove his clothing, and you lunge your trusty raptor so they can remove them gently and prevent ongoing pain. On to neuroprotective intubation. Now, this is a big topic and probably deserves its own rounds, but I'm going to try to focus on some major takeaway points. Control of the airway will likely be needed in context of decreased GCS and facilitation of CT scan. Most experts agree that in the absence of significant anatomical changes, uh, challenges, using induction with a paralytic, such as an RSI, is usually the safest approach. Once again, it comes down to defending the map and attacking the ICP, or at least not making it worse. How does intubation decrease MAP? Remember, these patients are in severe pain, and removing awareness of that pain can drop the sympathetic drive to maintain blood pressure and cardiac output, thus reducing MAP. Now, don't let that stop you from providing sedation and analgesia. Pain and laryngoscopy cause spikes in ICP, so provide sedation even if they're obtended. A common mistake is to give smaller doses or avoid sedation altogether in patients who are unresponsive or have decreased GCS. With this in mind, it's absolutely critical to resuscitate before you intubate, particularly if you recognize systemic shock and other contributors to hypotension. Treat and anticipate peri-intubation hypotension with vasopressors actively infusing or, or ready to be infused. You can use uh, 100 microgram push doses of phenylephrine or just get a norepi infusion started. The induction agent choice should be based on the patient's clinical status. If they've been hypotensive at any point or even running towards the lower end of normal, using a more hemodynamically stable agent such as ketamine or automidate is indicated. If they're hypertensive, you can also consider propofol. It's actually recommended as an independent ICP reducing agent by the BTF guidelines. Both ketamine and automidate are also safe options in the hypertensive patient. Speaking of ketamine, I want to reiterate what is all hopefully now common knowledge that the evidence that ketamine increases ICP is very poor. In fact, ketamine has been shown to decrease ICP in ventilated pediatric patients with intracranial hypertension secondary to TBI. Furthermore, furthermore, our, retrospective, furthermore our retrospective study of adult TBI patients undergoing RSI with either ketamine or automidate 
showed no difference in mortality or patient outcomes between the two groups. Ketamine is therefore a safe induction agent for neurologically injured patients. And indeed, many of the experts I spoke with use this as their uh, go-to induction agent choice. The other important factor in neuroprotective intubation is preventing spikes in ICP, which are likely to be caused by the sympathetic reflex of laryngoscopy. Let's explore some of the medications and methods that have been proposed to accomplish this. First of all, IV lidocaine. Now, most experts and guidelines agree that there's unsubstantial evidence to support using them. The oft-quoted paper supporting this practice was originally a small trial of 20 patients undergoing elective neurosurgery for cerebral neoplasms. Since then, several studies and two subsequent systematic reviews of TBI patients undergoing RSI did not show any benefit of IV lidocaine for decreasing ICP elevation. Furthermore, lidocaine may not be a benign medication. While there isn't good evidence to show harm with elevated ICP, a Cochrane review of pretreatment and mostly elective ORs did show a high odds ratio for adverse events such as bradycardia and hypotension. At best, IV lidocaine provides little to no benefit. At worst, it may contribute to hemodynamic instability. In either case, it's added complexity in an already high stakes situation. Therefore, I would recommend against using IV lidocaine as a pretreatment in RSI for neurologically injured patients. Topical lidocaine is another option. By directly anesthetizing the glottic area, it may blunt the stimulating effect of laryngoscopy while avoiding the potential at first systemic effects of IV lidocaine. Now, there's limited evidence for using topical lidocaine. A trial assessing lidocaine installation through an ET tube prior to suctioning in patients with TBI showed mitigation in the increase in ICP with no adverse effects. Obviously, this is a very different procedure than laryngoscopy, but it may point to a potential benefit of topical lidocaine in blunting sympathetic response. Also be aware that the time to maximum, maximal effect is four to five minutes. Therefore, it's reasonable to administer, topo, to administer topical lidocaine as long as time for analgesic effect permits. It should also not be used in patients that are, that are or have been vomiting. Fentanyl has also been proposed as a pretreatment to blunt sympathetic stimulation. Several studies have shown that IV fentanyl does mitigate rises in blood pressure and heart rate during RSI. There are limited studies assessing ICP changes with fentanyl, although a trial assessing ICP changes, again, during ET tube suctioning of patients with TBI did show significantly less increases in ICP in patients treated with opiates and neuromuscular blockade than with either agent alone. Despite this weak evidence, I think it's safe to assume that fentanyl likely does attenuate sympathetic response to noxious stimulus. But what about the adverse effects of fentanyl? Now, there's limited evidence to show that fentanyl causes adverse events in RSI of neurologically injured patients, although you should be wary of the loss of sympathetic tone brought on by providing analgesia. Therefore, it's prudent to have vasopressors ready to administer or even starting to infuse as you provide analgesia. It's also worth pushing fentanyl slowly over 60 seconds to minimize at risk of adverse effects. And most importantly, it's, it's needed to give at least at a high dose, three to five micrograms per kilogram IV, and at least three minutes prior to induction. Let's discuss another important aspect of ICP control during intubation, paralysis. Don't forget, a decreased GCS is not an indication to forego sedation. So with paralysis, in the past, there's this hypothetical concern that depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents like succinylcholine may increase ICP via muscle fasciculation after, after this effect was seen in some animal studies and an observational study of patients with CNS tumors, again, undergoing elective surgery. Now, this has mostly been debunked. A 2017 systematic review found several studies that showed no increase of ICP with succinylcholine in patients with neurologic injury. Furthermore, there's no evidence that pretreating with a defasciculating dose of a non-depolarizing NMVA like rapuronium prevented rises in ICP. So synalcholine actually has the advantage of a shorter duration of action, allowing for expedited neurological exam. But obviously, rapuronium itself only lasts about 45 minutes to an hour at normal induction doses. And this patient will likely need a CT scan relatively soon after intubation, which rapuronium actually may help facilitate. Speaking to Dr. Howard Lesiak, he says that in his experience, 
the use of rocuronium in the ED has not been a major impediment to his ability to examine patients and make treatment decisions, but does acknowledge that other surgeons have raised issues with it. All that to say, in the absence of true contraindications to succinylcholine, choose whichever paralytic agent you feel is most appropriate. Finally, be considerate with your placement of the ET tube itself. Remember that laryngoscopy is stimulating, so have the most experienced intubator and use the least amount of force needed to adequately visualize the cords. Our discussion of neuroprotective intubation is summarized here. Remember to always, have, always assess the, the anatomic and other physiological predictors of a difficult airway before proceeding. Also, please ensure that these patients have adequate post-intubation sedation and analgesia order. For further details on this, I would direct you to the fantastic best practice recommendation published, by, published in CGEM by our own Drs. Hendon and Drs. Rosenberg. Let's revisit our case. In order to optimize this patient for a tight neuroprot neuroprotective intubation, you call for push doses of phenylephrine to be drawn up. You then ask the RN to provide a 250 microgram bolus of IV fentanyl over a six slow 60 second push. As you give it time to take effect, you prepare your airway equipment and run through an airway checklist with the room. You then perform an RSI with 100 milligrams of ketamine and 100 milligrams of rocuronium. Then use a glide scope with minimal glottic pressure to smoothly pass the ET tube, then call for post-intubation sedation with propofol and fentanyl infusions. If our patient continues to show signs of elevated ICP despite initial steps, we need to move on to refractory management. Although the evidence behind these treatments is less clear, there is expert consensus amongst the guidelines that they can be beneficial. However, their potential benefits must be balanced with their inherent risks. I'm going to focus on treatments that we have the expertise to provide as emergency physicians while our neurosurgical and critical care colleagues are getting involved. These include hyperosmolar therapy and hyperventilation. Let's begin by discussing hyperosmolar fluids and establish some important points. Firstly, there's plenty of evidence to show that hyperosmolar fluids reduce ICP and we'll discuss the mechanism behind that. However, there is next to no evidence to show that they improve patient outcomes. There have also been several studies comparing different hyper hyperosmolar fluids, in particular mannitol and hypertonic saline. You may have heard that there is mounting evidence for hypertonic saline over mannitol, and this is reflected in the guidelines, with hypertonic saline essentially being regarded as equal, if not better, in particular instances. The guidelines, for the most part, agree that hyperosmolar fluids should only be given as boluses and not as continuous infusions. Let's explore why the experts may be turning towards hypertonic saline over mannitol, starting with the physiology. So in simple terms, hyperosmolar fluids work by reducing cerebral edema. They do this by creating an osmotic gradient to pull water across the blood-brain barrier. Their ability to do this is based on two important factors. First, the osmotic reflection coefficient which is a measure of how permeable the blood-brain barrier is to the particular molecule, ranging from, ranging from zero, where the molecule can freely diffuse, to one, where it cannot move freely at all and is thus more osmotically active. Mannitol has a reflection coefficient of 0.9, whereas hypertonic saline has a co coefficient of one, giving it the slight advantage in, in this regard. However, the second and arguably more important factor is the number of effective osmols we're providing. Normally, mannitol is dosed uh, using a 20% concentration at 0.25 to 1 gram per kilogram, which we can think of as a 1.25 to 5 milliliter per kilogram dose. Its osmolarity is approximately 1,100 milliosmoles per liter. Now, a hypertonic saline, and it comes in a variety of concentrations, and there's little guidance from the, the guidelines on uh, in terms of dosing. However, if we consider our TOH formulary 3% solution, it actually has a nearly identical osmolarity to 20% mannitol. So we can use the same milliliter per kilogram dosing, and we know we are providing the same number of effective osmoles as mannitol. So say we take a 70 kilogram patient and use a middle of the road mannitol dose of 0.5 grams per kilogram. We can determine our milliliter dose of mannitol and simply use the same milliliter dose of hypertonic saline, given it has the same osmolarity. This point about effective osmols is important to keep in mind when looking at studies comparing the two fluids. For my research, there are five meta-analyses to consider this, each with a slight variation on the theme. 
So we involved TBI patients only and found no overall difference in ICP reduction or mortality between the two fluids. Two specifically compared equiosmolar doses of hypertonic saline and mannitol and actually did find an improvement in ICP control for the hypertonic saline group over the mannitol group. Now, there are several limitations with these studies. For example, many included fluid additives like dextran and used a wide variety of hypertonic saline con concentrations, of which 7.5% was actually the most common. But they bring up an interesting point. When the effective osmols of the fluid provided were equal, hypertonic saline appeared to control ICP better. And this makes sense based on the physiology we discussed. It's also important to consider the adverse effects of hyperosmolar fluids. Mannitol is known to cause an osmotic diuresis through its effects on water and sodium reabsorption in the renal tubules, which can result in hypotension and renal injury. Hypertonic saline, on the other hand, has the risk of central pontine myelinolysis with rapid correction of hyponatremic patients, as well as extravasation injuries. Therefore, concentrations higher than 3% should be infused via central line. The theoretical adverse effects of rebound ICP and re reverse osmosis with either fluid have not really borne out in the literature. The Seattle TBI consensus recommends monitoring uh, both hyperosmolar fluids with blood work, limiting serum sodium to less than 155 and osmolality to 320, although they do note that these cutoffs are based on pretty low quality evidence. This may be beyond the scope of our ED care, but it's certainly worth being mindful of and at least sending these serum tests if you haven't already. In conclusion, I will likely be reaching for hypertonic saline, ensuring an adequate osmolar dose. If hypertonic saline is not available or there's a delay in receiving from pharmacy, I will certainly reach for mannitol in the patient with refractory elevated ICP. It's important to place a Foley to monitor diuresis, particularly for mannitol, and to monitor serum sodium and osmols. This is the dosing that, uh, I would, that I would use. And like Dr. English says, when in doubt, a 70 kilogram person can get 250 milliliters of whatever is closest. Let's move on to hyperventilation. As we discussed in the physiology section, hypocapnia induces cerebral arterial vasoconstriction, thereby minimizing cerebral blood flow and hypothetically mitigating worsening cerebral edema or hematoma expansion. Hyperventilation has thus been proposed as a treatment for refractory ICP elevation. The evidence for benefit is weak at best. In three small studies assessing transient hyperventilation in TBI, only two showed a significant reduction in ICP, whereas one did not. And this proposed reduction in ICP needs to be balanced by the risk of cerebral ischemic injury. Although this was only seen in patients who presumably underwent prolonged hyperventilation for many days. One RCT also suggests prolonged hyperventilation may actually re impede recovery, with hyperventilated patients having worse neurological outcomes at three and six months, but not at 12 months. Again, note this was prolonged hyperventilation over five days. Taking this limited evidence together, it seems that transient hyperventilation in the magnitude of hours is associated with a reduction in ICP, whereas prolonged hyperventilation in the magnitude of days is associated with surrogate markers of global cerebral ischemia and possibly neuro or poor neurological outcomes. In addition to extensive clinical experience, the Seattle consensus algorithm places maintenance of end tidal CO2 at the low end of normal in their first tier of treatment. And mild hypocapnia uh, at 32 to 35 millimeters of mercury in their second tier of treatment. The NCS guidelines similarly recommends brief episodes of hyperventilation with patients with uh, acute elevations in ICP. In discussion with local experts, I would advocate for patients being assessed by end tidal or arterial blood gas and sent, set to a particular target based on their clinical status. Remember that end tidal CO2 should be targeted slightly lower due to dead space ventilation and that, this, uh, that dead space ventilation can vary depending on comorbidities. Transient hyperventilation to a hypocapnic level should only be used as a refractory management for patients with ongoing clinical signs of elevated ICP. In summary, these are my recommendations for refractory management of elevated ICP. So in our case, the patient has returned from CTT scan you have, and you have even higher concept concern for elevated ICP based on those imaging findings. So you start a 250 cc bolus of hypertonic saline over five minutes and quickly send an arterial blood gas to determine whether you need to begin hyperventilating this patient. The ICU and neurosurgery teams arrive and the patient is whisked away to the ICU for ongoing supportive care. 
That concludes our discussion of fundamental management of elevated ICP in the ED. Now we've talked about many therapies, but there's one notable exclusion from the treatment list, and I want to address it now. Corticosteroids. Many physicians still use steroids as an empiric treatment of elevated ICP, but in fact, there's very strong evidence against their use in many of the conditions we discussed today. Let's start with TBI. The BTF has a level one recommendation against corticosteroids, primarily based on the original CRASH trial, which showed uh, increased mortality uh, for, uh, for TBI patients with a decreased GCS who received corticosteroids. This trial actually required unmasking early due to clear difference in two-week mortality favoring the placebo group. Six-month follow-up was also, uh, also favored the uh, placebo group in terms of mortality and severe disability. This is a clear indication that we should not be giving steroids in traumatic brain injury. For ICH, a 2005 Cochrane review found no evidence to support the routine use of steroids and in fact highlighted a potential for harm with increased mortality and infectious and diabetic complications in the steroid treatment arms. The NCS therefore recommends against the use of corticosteroids in ICH. What about in non-hemorrhagic conditions? Well, for ischemic stroke, the AHA guidelines state there is insufficient data on the use of steroids in ischemic cere cerebral or cerebellar swelling and does not recommend them. This is based on a 2011 Cochrane review of eight randomized trials, which found no benefit. Regardless, steroids are not indicated for cerebral edema and acute ischemic stroke. For bacterial meningitis, the evidence for corticosteroids supports a reduction in rates of hearing loss and possibly decreased mortality specifically in S. pneumoniae meningitis and tuberculous meningitis. So I think it's reasonable to give in that case. And finally, CNS tumors. Admittedly, I haven't talked a lot about CNS tumors as the, uh, the evidence uh, is limited. But that being said, corticosteroids are one treatment that appear to have some supporting evidence and consensus is their treatment, admittedly on a relatively uh, limited evidence base. Given the strong recommendations against their use in some conditions, I would recommend against the empirical use of corticosteroids in the undifferentiated patient with elevated ICP and only for targeted therapy in particular etiologies such as bacterial meningitis and CNS tumors after ruling out hemorrhagic conditions with a CT scan. That brings us to the conclusion of my presentation. In summary, I propose using a phased approach to diagnosing and managing patients with elevated ICP in the emergency department based on the multiple guidelines available. Diagnosis in the ED depends on cl clinical suspicion based on history and multiple non-invasive findings, as no single finding is diagnostic in isolation. At this point, optic nerve sheath diameter is not ready for prime time. And remember to document a thorough initial neurological exam. Fundamental, in, fundamental management is based on tight hemodynamic control and minimization of pain. And these are the uh, recommended initial management steps. Refractory treatments need to be within the emergency physician's toolkit with an understanding of their limitations and adverse effects. Notably, corticosteroids are not part of the empiric approach. And if you remember nothing else, here are some key takeaways. So diagnosis requires multiple non-invasive signs. Don't necessarily wait for CT to initiate treatment. Neuroprotective intubation, vasopressors, and fentanyl are essential for this. And you can stop using IV lidocaine. For osmolar fluids, hypertonic saline is likely better than mannitol at equiosmolar dosing with less side effects. But both are effective. So use what's ready, readily available and anticipate that osmotic diuresis with mannitol. Corticosteroids are not a component of empiric ICP treatment. Some thanks and acknowledgements. Huge thank you to Ariel for being a fantastic supervisor and support, as well as the experts who were kind enough to take the time and explain neurocritical care fundamentals to me. As always, thank you to Krish for helping me fine tune my presentation and just for being an all around badass mentor. And a special shout out to my little brother, Kamo who spent the time to teach me the value of an effective presentation. Does anyone have any questions?